I'm Karen Colley. I'm a sixth year PhD student in biology. I do all my research here at Queens College, so I'm going to give you a quick tour of our lab and introduce you to some of the people that I work with. So this is my lab where I spend most of my time. This is Christina, who's doing work with egg cannibalism, so she just finished setting up um, baby beetles on eggs to see what they would do, if they would eat them or not. This is Kazi back here working in our incubator. So he's taking care of our colonies, seeing if they're laying eggs, um, just taking care of the beetles that we're going to be doing our experiments with. And we can keep them in the incubator, which is at a set uh, temperature, set day length, so we can convince them it's summer all year long, so they stay active and continue to be useful in our experiments. And then we've got another workspace back here, and my pet finches, uh, pineapple, nut, pinon, pina, and colada who are here for moral support and general entertainment. So this is the Colorado potato beetle. Leptinotarsa decimilineata is a scientific name. Decimilineata refers to the fact that it has 10 stripes on the back. Um, Undecimilineata has 11 stripes. They still live down in Mexico, uh, which is where this beetle is originally from. Um, they're kind of, I tell people I work with insects and they go, ew, and then I show them one and they decide it's not all that bad. It's got polka dots on the head, stripes on the back, a little bit cute. Not very big. The lab is studying the Colorado potato beetle because it's one of the largest crop pest in the world. It's the largest potato pest in the world. Um, it originated in Mexico where it ate this really awful weed. Um, these are some pods, some seed pods of the weed that it ate. So it's really thorny, nobody liked it. So it wasn't a problem there because it was taking care of a weed that nobody liked. But as cattle moved up from Mexico into the US in the 1800s, the weed moved up with it, the potato beetle moved up with that, and then switched over to potato, which is closely related to this weed. So it's a problem here in the US, it's a problem in Canada, it's a problem in Europe, Asia, Russia. Um, so we're studying it along with a host of other labs all across the country, trying to figure out better ways to slow it down and stop it, if at all possible. An example of human introductions that we're all familiar with um, are actually many of our most familiar bird species in New York City. So the starling is one example. They were introduced by a Shakespeare fanatic who wanted to introduce every bird that was mentioned in any of Shakespeare's works into Central Park and most of the introductions failed, um, but Starling succeeded. He released something like 40 pairs one year and then 60 pairs a, a few years after that, and they've, you know, they've, they've been tremendously successful and they're now um, distributed everywhere in the United States. Um, our other two other common city birds are house sparrows and house finches, and both of them were introduced as well. Selection is what happens when um, some environmental factor influences the traits that do best in, in a species of organisms. So like in my finches, you can see that, like I've got one here who's got a white head, um, and it's because her mother was albino. So that's a trait that I can select for. If I like that they have white, then I can choose to allow her to breed and not allow gray ones to breed. So if I allow her to breed, then more of my finches in the future will have white on them because it's a trait that I've selected for. There's this idea that you can slow the evolution of resistance to pesticides by leaving part of your crop, part of your field, untreated. The method that's been proposed the most for slowing the evolution of resistance is called um, the use of refuge crops. And I have a little animation that's supposed to show, that will hopefully show how they work. The idea of a refuge is that you leave part of your field untreated with a pesticide. And that's important because the pesticide kills all but the very f most resistant individuals in the treated area. But then hopefully you have enough immigration from the refuge so that most of the matings that take place are between those susceptible immigrants and those few highly resistant individuals, making most of their offspring hybrids. If resistance is recessive enough, those 
hybrids will themselves be at least partly susceptible to the pesticide, and you can get rid of those resistance genes by moving them into hybrids. We are going to the Zolniki potato farm in Riverhead, Long Island. Um, potatoes have just come out of the ground, and the weather's been unseasonably warm this year, so the beetles are out earlier than they normally are. We just came to Riverhead, Long Island. We came last week, but uh, the weather wasn't so great, so all the beetles were hiding are underground. So we're hoping to change our luck today. The weather looks pretty great out here. It doesn't even look like he's eating anything. So this is potato. You know, when it's full grown, it'll be about this high and vining over everywhere. But uh, that's the beetle that eats them. Farmer's worst nightmare. Which is why the farmers love for us to come out and take them away. This is a pre-mating pair, or post-mating, not sure, but that's a male on top and a female on bottom. And there's another beetle underneath them, five on one plant. Yeah, so after collecting five for like an hour, I collected over a hundred in like less than 30 minutes. So yeah, we, uh, there's a lot of them. We just stopped uh, collecting because I'm kind of hungry. I mean, they're having a good lunch, but I need to have my lunch too, so here you go.